wasted. Uh, the pumpkin festival that we hold every year might be a target for a terrorist attack. So oh, we that's need great. to be prepared for that. You know how those guys feel about pumpkins, right? Yeah, I'm like, fucking... Have you, have you seen them? I don't know if you've spent too much time in New Hampshire, but it really is like... <laughs> no, and thank fucking God. I, lo- I love New Hampshire, but it definitely is the redneck twin brother to Vermont. Like, Vermont is like the hippie burnout brother of the states, and then New Hampshire is like this weird wannabe redneck state, and I've never understood it. You will never see more Confederate flags north of the Mason-Dixon line <laughs> than in New Hampshire. And I, it's just like, no, you guys, you didn't fight on that side. <laughs> you're, you're distinctly in the north. I don't know what to say anymore. Uh, New Hampshire. You know what? Here's the fun question. Yes. Can we, can we get in on this deal? Who do we contact from the military industrial complex? Because I want a bear cat. Yeah. Let's... I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Well, uh, if we keep with the shitty intro or we might anger some people and then this podcast might be the target of a terrorist attack. Well, literally that's how uh, William Castle got those buzzers for the Tinkler. <laughs> I'm thinking, how can we enhance the podcast with this advanced technology? Can we fly a drone in your face if you're listening to this and then be like, we see you and then post images of your face on Instagram. How does that sound? Everybody? Uh, I don't trust you with leave the, a comment with the taser that you already own. I don't trust you with a bear cat at all. I don't own a taser. I'm sorry, your stun gun. Semantics are important <laughs> about some things. Sometimes semantics make a legal difference. Yeah, I don't think so much in that case. Um, I mean, if this this is supposed to be a good podcast, semantically, <laughs> that's what it's supposed to be. You know what also, like, the specifics don't really matter much in? What? Surrealist short films. <gasps> Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max, he's Austin, and today we're doing something a little different. I was trying to create a surrealist like moment where people are like, what does it mean? And then try to interpret exactly what's going on. Well, now you're explaining it, so you're ruining the surrealist moment of it. You, you never explain anything. You just show shit and then let other people interpret it. And then sometimes you go on to be a fascist asshole and get kicked out of the surrealist movement. But Only sometimes. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes you betray your friends to the to the Franco regime in Spain. Yeah. And sometimes you you tell them where their location is so they can go kill them. But then sometimes your friends escape and turn out to be a very successful filmmaker. Sometimes. I wonder if people have guessed what movie we're doing. We I, haven't said it yet, have we? No. Uh and I don't I would be genuinely surprised if anybody is just like, "Oh, yes, of course, they're doing this one today." I guarantee you everyone who is aware of it is probably aware of what it is. Because we are doing Un Chien Andalou, which is the most, I repeat, the most watched sort of avant-garde experimental film in any sort of film program or film 101 class. That's the one. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. Um, what would you offer, offer as an alternative? Uh, whenever, like, I mean, I love Eraserhead, but, like, I always, like, whenever any teacher I've had is, like, trying to slowly, like push people into like accepting surrealism like a razor head is the one they start people off with before they like sort of plunge them into i guess stuff. although that seems to be a different type of film class i mean historically a razor head is not a surrealist film no it's not but it's where you like in it, in terms of weirdness yeah sure like in terms of a class on like taste in film sure but i mean historically if you're talking about surrealist movies and just if I'm, you're talking about the surrealist movement in particular from a specific time period then yes i'll give you that the, and surrealist movies yeah but also like i think the thing is that it's not just that it's like it is a, a very commonly pointed to starting point yeah. in terms of like movies people made independently that were experimental Right. And I use the word avant garde to describe it. And a lot of people would argue about what's avant garde cinema versus experimental cinema versus underground cinema. Doesn't fucking matter for this conversation. The point is, a lot of people point to this as the starting point, which is why I chose to do it for this week. Um, I figure it'd be interesting to do commentaries for a lot of those experimental films as uh, seemingly pointless as that might, might sometimes seem. There's a lot of interesting ones that I think we could enjoy talking about. And since we do this clearly for our enjoyment and not yours, if you can't tell, uh, I think it was worth doing this because I think... Wait, we do this for our own enjoyment? Fuck, why did I agree to do this then? (laughs) Well, I just assumed we did it for our own enjoyment because nobody else enjoys it, surely. 
But yeah, I guess the point I'm making is that uh, I chose to do it this week because it's just yet another genre or type of movie or tradition of filmmaking that we haven't touched upon yet. And I feel like whenever we look for an entry point into an auteur's career or a certain genre, uh, it's really sort of fun to start that off because then we can sort of refer back to it and we have a point of reference going forward for doing more of it. So yeah, that's pretty much the reason for doing this. I have no idea how this is going to turn out because, uh, again, it's only like what, 16 to 21 minutes, depending on the version you watch. And by the way, I will link to the version we're watching uh, of this movie. But anyway, um, I'm not sure how this episode is going to go, but we're going to try our best. Yeah. That's all we could do. Um, I'm not going to apologize in advance, but I'm just going to give you guys a heads up that this is going to be a bit different than a normal episodes. Cause like we said, it's like, how about you explain the format? Okay. So Austin pitched this to me and my first response is what the fuck are you talking about? We can't do a 15 minute short film on our podcast where we commentate over movies. It's going to be the shortest and least eventful episode of the podcast ever. And Austin, like he often does, said, no, you're wrong. And <laughs> then... <laughs> and then proved why I'm right. Sure. Aha! Sure. Um, so the format we're going to be doing, we're going to be watching this movie twice. And each time, um, the first time will be one of our reactions to what we're seeing and focusing on that. And then the second time, we'll be focusing on the other person's reactions to that. Because otherwise, like, I'll say something... And then Austin will try to explain it to me and we'll be halfway done with the movie and it won't be good for your listening pleasure. This way you can get more of a feel for what really stands out to us in this, what we like about it, what we don't like about it, how much I hate Salvador Dali. You you get all of that. Yeah, one for one run, one of us is going to be the co-pilot and then on the other, we We, we we are the navigator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I figured that was the best way to do it, especially because I think an underrated part of appreciating any sort of experimental film in this vein is, uh, how much these movies focus on having a sort of provocative or affective response, you know? And that's an important part. Uh, it's not in a sense it is you bring your own interpretation, but it's not really that stupid. That's a stupid way of saying something that in practice in good experimental movies like this, and this one particularly, is much more sophisticated in terms of its execution. Well, yeah, and also, like, there are good surrealist, experimental, nonlinear movies that a big part of it is you bringing your own interpretation or your own baggage or your own mental hang-ups to it and, like, the film playing on those and it affecting you in a different way. But the difference between a good one and an insufferable one is there are ideas behind the images you're seeing rather than just random fucking bullshit that looked cool to film. Yeah. And you shoving that together in a movie and then saying that you bring your own interpretation. That's not surrealist. That's not intelligent. That's not artistic. That's lazy filmmaking. Right. And it's pretentious. Yes. Even more aggravatingly, but this is, this is pretentious. Laziness is like the the (laughs) most offensive kind of filmmaking. Yeah, absolutely. But like, it's just, this is a good thing we're bringing this up because this is also something I kind of want to touch upon because we're talking about a tradition of filmmaking that comes from this film. We can also count that tradition as including all those fucking aggravating student short films that you watched, even if they're unaware of this movie. Yeah. They're participating in what they imagine some sort of creative, artistic, nonlinear thing might be. And they don't actually, I, I guess here's the way to put it, right? In terms of differentiating one from the other, I think the, the most basic element that would divide one from the other, from the good, from the bad, is that, uh, one, you have that pretense of meaning. Whereas this, the whole point is, a, is that it doesn't mean anything. It's a weird like contradiction where if you have the stupid version of it, it insists on its own lack of meaning and, and like nonsense, right? Whereas this is like, it's rich of imagery and it just lets you associate it. It puts sort of thought into the images that it conjures up and how those things interact. And it allows you, it sort of, it, it alienates you and prevents you from creating coherent meaning by the sort of proliferation of ideas and images rather than a sheer lack of them. You know what I mean? 
And the sheer lack of them, ironically enough, if you're saying it has no meaning, you have produced a meaning. It's just stupid. Which is infuriating. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, you just did something stupid. Yeah. The intent is clear because clearly you had no plan. Whereas with this, even though they talk about it in a way that, and we'll talk about this, in terms of the production, they talk about this idea of psychic automatism or whatever. Uh, that's not how it works. They put conscious thought into doing this and uh, there's machinery behind it. You know, the things interact with one another. It just thwarts you from being able to actually come up with some sort of totalizing meaning. You well, know, no, and like, this is like, I like weird stuff. I like surrealism. I like nonlinear filmmaking. I like just, uh, it's some of my favorite movies are just movies that you sort of just like dive in, float along rather than like go along a narrow stream. You just sort of just like float along in this lake of shit and you're flying around. <laughs> um, Dolly, one of the co-directors of this movie, um, is somewhat of an infuriating figure for me because on one hand, I love his art. I think he was a brilliant artist. I think um, for however much he contributed to this, you can tell some of his scenes are a little bit, some of the more obvious things that might be just me projecting, but I think we both agree with on, on some of those things. On some of them, we'll, yes. we'll get back to that. Um, on the other hand, Salvador Dali is a, was a insufferable human being. He betrayed the entire surrealist yeah, movement to cozy up to the fascist Franco regime in Spain, um, which kind of defeats the entire purpose of surrealism. Um, yeah, surrealism is political. Yeah. <laughs> That's the other difference, I'd say. This movie has a political agenda, whereas other nonsense garbage is not aware of that. Yeah. It's pure personal expression. And... Now you can't. There's always the argument, like, why do we still learn about Lenny Riefenstahl in film yeah, programs, despite like her being like a, sure a member of the Nazi Party, and the reason we still learn about her is because, regardless of whether or not you agree with their politics, like, you can make the same argument. Like, on the other side, like for the Soviet montage, why do we learn about Soviet filmmaking? It's just like because they produced something with filmmaking that hadn't been seen before. Or you could just stay at home. Yeah. How about Birth of a Nation? Yes. Like, yeah, exactly. There are problematic films in the past that unfortunately <laughs> are just like, like, what the fuck? <laughs> that are unfortunately yeah. iconic for one reason or another. Whether or not like Triumph of the Will, Birth of a Nation, or Battleship Potemkin like aligns with your political beliefs. And for most of those, I hope that they don't. Uh, I think I'd be careful about saying stuff about the Soviets if I were you. That's why I said most of them. Um, I wouldn't, I would, I would like set the Soviets aside a little bit of that. I'd say they're prac. This is a different conversation. I think a lot of their films ideologically are quite non-problematic as uh, far as like okay, Eisenstein beside, and those guys. I'm trying to, this is beside the point. Yeah. Yes. But even if I think Salvador Dali is a fascist fuckwit who, deserve to be thrown in a flaming pit. That doesn't mean I can't appreciate his art, which infuriatingly I find to have that's some of my favorite surrealist work. I find this to be an incredibly powerful surrealist short film. And I respect the art, even if I hate the artist, that's basically the point I wanted to bring up. Well, luckily we can always just say that Luis Bunuel was responsible for most, most of it. Yes, we can. Lu Louis, 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 Louis. There's no, I don't know because I'm not sure because he is in a, in my mind, he's like, he was born in Spain. Right. I think, but also like, and he grew up there, but also he's kind of like an international human, you know, I'm going to go with Louis until uh, this was made when it. he was, when, when they were in France. Yeah. So I don't know. So other people we'll call him Boonwell. Boonwell. <laughs> okay. LB. LB. Sure. Yeah. Um, LB, my favorite director who I'm not, as familiar with, honestly. Yeah, he's not actually my favorite director, but I do fucking love his movies. Um, there's never been a guy who makes better movies about uh, the the rich people or um, religion. I think he is the sharpest filmmaker in both of those aspects. And uh, he's made a ton of good movies. This is his first movie. Um, 
and he made it alongside uh, Dali because they were pals. They were both in their like late twenties. This is before they were well known, and they made this movie specifically so they could gain entrance to this uh, society, the surreal society in Paris at the time of artists that they wanted to collaborate with and work with. So this movie fulfills a very practical goal for them, which is why when they're talking about how it was produced and everything, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, not only because Dali claims a great deal of credit for everything and that's (laughs) highly debatable, (laughs) um, but also because the making of this film is almost what they were trying to produce more so than the film itself. Because they're like, look, we made a surrealist film. Let us into your society of surrealists. <laughs> Give us the cool password people. to the treehouse now. Yeah, exactly. That's 100% what it is. And that's I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's helpful in viewing this in context. Um, I think I watched this for the first time several years ago. It wasn't in a film class, but it was as a result of having watched some Boonwell stuff and then being like, oh, you've got to check out this movie because it is of unique historical importance, right? And uh, I think I remember feeling pretty struck by it in terms of the imagery, obviously. But also one thing that really I think I've responded to in terms of this movie, which I feel like is maybe a dividing line, again, between shallow surrealism and perhaps we can even say like Dali turning to fascism. We can tie this in with this. And uh, what is actually sort of like profoundly surreal, whether it's politically surreal or just aesthetically, is this sense of play and uh, kind of enjoyment and irreverence, right? Okay. It's kind of, you can maybe even associate it with something like punk, right? Yeah. Where it's like, think of this movie playing for its audience. This is a movie playing to uh, sort of an art leisure uh, class in Paris at this time. And it's specifically made for them, and it's sort of like an in-joke for these people. And the in-joke is supposed to be shocking, and sort of like assault the senses, right? And it's supposed to be subversive, but it is not subversive through sheer randomness, right? It is setting up expectations of one thing and then just being completely crazy and off the wall in other ways. You can always watch this movie and find some sort of continuity from one scene to the next that prevents it from being purely confusing. You know what I mean? It is not surreal in the sense that it completely does away with rules. It's that it in every moment finds a new way to take the rule and do something unexpected with it. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And it kind of like, it changes its rules in almost every scene, yeah. but the, it flows between those change Continuity. of rules rather yeah. than like, Oh, well, th- okay. This is happening now. No, like the, the movie, even though it's, it's internal logic is changing constantly. Like, you feel like you're along for the ride for that rather than just being like, wait, what fuck were he? Okay. Fuck. Okay. Absolutely. And that I think is part of why this movie, even after almost a hundred years now, it is literally 90 years since this movie came out. I think it still holds something of value. And, uh, I think they created something that is definitively, I won't say timeless, but has a definitive like, affective property to it not merely because of the strength of the imagery which i think is a sort of a trait that it shares with a lot of silent movies oh this is our first silent movie by the way yeah awesome uh Uh, but like it it also because it plays with those things and they interact with each other in such a fluid and like focused way it creates an experience that it it works as a movie and it still holds up. You were talking about a uh, striking imagery and I think that's yeah. a good time for me to get into my very limited history with this film. Sure. Um, I actually had never watched the entire uh, short film prior to preparing for the podcast, but I had seen clips of it. Um, mainly in documentaries talking about like the history of shocking filmmaking and yeah. whatnot. Mainly the image of the woman's eyeball being slit and the death horse and the death's head moth. Um, both of those I had, seen before and once we started watching it I'm like oh it's this movie <laughs> um, I wonder if the Simpsons did an episode of, of this uh, there's so many things where it's like oh that's where the Simpsons took that from that's that's like um whenever like because I'm a big sucker for musicals I, I love them um, mainly because I whenever I listen to songs I try to like a lot of songs are telling a story and I try to like fully envision that so I like musicals because they come with a built in story already sure um, so whenever I go back and watch like old musicals, I'm just like, 
oh, so this is like, because Seth MacFarlane loves taking those and just like randomly shoving them into Family Guy for no apparent reason, other than the fact that he's a sucker for old-timey musicals. So if you've ever watched Family Isn't Guy... Isn't that how he does everything with Family Guy? Yeah. I don't really have... No, like I like a lot of interest in that show. Neither do I. It's just like like flashbacks from middle school of like watching that show with friends and just being like, oh, so that's where he stole this from. Oh, that's where he stole that from. Well, it's like that is a good part about going back and watching older cultures. You can find out that a lot of people that create content aren't nearly as original as you think they are. Yes, everybody steals. Yeah, and uh, the people who bake in an awareness of theft into their movies, I think, is always very interesting. Whenever you have that sort of intertextual element, but anyway, that's a different discussion. I mean, in terms of this movie, obviously, in terms of uh, your own experience with it, it's kind of hard to escape an awareness of it entirely. And uh, it's, I th- I'm glad you're talking about this because I think a useful conversation to have in terms of watching it on your own is like, what is this movie's viability today in terms of like it remaining shocking or potent? Well, yeah, like we live in, in, we live in the post saw era where it's just like everything and everything has been shown in movies at this point. Like it's very hard to shock your audience. We're, or post torture porn genre. Like, you know, right. Like those movies like had their phase and like, like gore hound movies, like almost aren't a thing anymore. Like the popular horror shocking movies now are like for the most part, psychological. I mean like her- yeah. hereditary freaked some people out last year, but like that's not the most violent movie ever shown. It's more because like the violence kind of was just came out of nowhere and was done in a gross shocking way rather than like it being the centerpiece of the film. Sure. Um, but hold on, I'll offer a hypothesis in a world where you have 24 seven media cycles, right. And instant access to media. I feel like through the sheer repetition of engaging, engaging with media so frequently, you are inevitably going to build up, uh, a sort of catalog of experiences where you are progressively shocked more and more. And then it ceases to be shocking once that has happened. I think that's similar to the way this movie works because part of the reason this movie is still sort of like worth engaging in is because there is a sort of worth in the idea of novelty. And even though we can point to other movies before this and say, this isn't strictly the first surrealist film, it's sort of like this movie is an, a historical occurrence. It's almost like performance art. It's like you see it once and you're like, oh, that happened. That was an event that happened, right? And it's like, okay, we can like... We can like read about the Titanic sinking, but none of us were like there. Yeah. You know what I mean? And this, in a weird way, it's kind of like that with that mo- this movie where it's like, well, no one was there, you know? Like, so you're watching it. The movie itself almost becomes watching like the secondhand experience where the real thing you're trying to gain access to is that room in which it was screened the first time. So I don't know. Parts of it, I think, allow it to hold up now and it remains potent just sheerly on how it's made but i think it's more notable for like you said it's a historical significance um there is shocking imagery there's interesting imagery there's imagery to be deconstructed and analyzed and stuff you can learn if you not even if you're just a like want to make a film in the vein of surrealism but if you want to make a film definitely with any like sort of bizarro elements i that's not the best term, but it's the term I'm sticking with. Um, I think there can be a lot to be gleaned from this movie. Um, just don't end up cozying up to the Franco regime if you do end up watching this movie. And that'd be a real. Vein. I think we'd all be in a lot of trouble if somehow that was happening. Yeah, that'd be. First of all, my question would be how. Second <laughs> of all, uh, where can I go where that's not happening? Uh, but anyway, um, I think. Yeah, I think we we're just about ready yes. to jump into it. However, I do want to touch on the production of it, okay, and, and that stuff, um, and then say a few more things. First of all, this is definitely going to be one of the episodes where um, I'm just going to like throw some quotes, probably from different sources, in in the uh, show notes because we're definitely since we're so eloquent, right? We're definitely going to be say say all our thoughts clearly about this movie, of course, um, definitely. So uh, when we do that. Uh, and then you you realize that we were lying. You can see somebody write it out in a way that you makes sense. You can see somebody <laughs> who like actually like has articulated opinions. Yes, about it. But uh, 
but anyway, aside from that, I think it's worth noting that the attempt with this movie was a certain type of, again, psychic automatism, right? Which is basically the idea of like, I'm going to not have a conscious thought and just see where my hand goes when I'm drawing, right? And I'm creating straight from the unconscious. I become a conduit through which the unseen parts of my mind are going to communicate. And I will enunciate them, right? Except here's the thing about making movies that way is that that shit doesn't happen when you're making movies. That can't work. It can happen when you're painting or something, not when you're making movies. Because when you're making movies, you've got to go action or you've got to go, I think we got to do another take because that didn't expose. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not that as, doesn't happen. It's not as immediate as an art form. No. So inevitably, this movie fails at its own goal, <laughs> right? Of actually trying to do that, which again, was their purported goal in making it. But again... Purported being the important word there. Again, that's the story they're telling. And I think they were aware of that when they were making it. And their awareness of their failure to do that through the medium of film is actually what saves this movie because they compensate by investing a lot of potential thought into the, uh, into the images. You know what I mean? They say that this movie isn't made to be interpreted in any sense, and that's true. However, this movie teases you. It shows you so many different doors you could open, right? There's lots of biographical references, which is deliberate. They deliberately did that and they consciously did it and thought about it beforehand, right? But the thing is, it never lets you actually arrive at a totalizing uh, or unifying sort of uh, theory of this movie, you know? Um, and that's the thing that I think is really fun about it is because it offers a lot of possibilities, but it never lets you settle Yeah, it on closes one. the door to those possibilities before you have time to walk through and take a look around, which is... I would say it's, I mean, I guess my point is that it's not like closing the door. It's like, well, all the doors are open and it refuses to point at which one is okay, correct. Yeah. And then also every time you open one, you're like, well, the meaning I was looking for isn't, not all of it is here, clearly. Well, also the fact that it's like, it's a short film and it's moving along so rapidly. Like yeah. you don't really have a lot of time to look around, which yeah. I think kind of goes also, in its favor. I also say that, uh, again, if you want, another examination of this type of filmmaking, you got to look at their follow-up Lodge door uh, because that is the one that caused riots. A lot of people point to this one as being one that was shocking and like subversive, right? Although this kind of got, this movie honestly got a mild reaction. You have stories of Bunuel holding rocks in his pockets during the first screening, just in case a riot started. No, uh, <laughs> he might've said he did that. Maybe he did, but that didn't happen. People were very, they were like cows. They were just eating grass and they're like, what's this a movie? And then, uh, it was with their next collaboration, which I think I may enjoy more honestly. Um, but with their next movie that people went crazy. So that one is probably worth talking about as well at some point. But yeah, I think we've, we've maybe said, in the future, but yeah, yeah, I think we've sort of exhausted one last thing. Okay. In terms of watching this movie, if nothing else, Probably the place to start is to not look for meaning again, but try to think of it in terms of looking for how it's trying to provoke you. Not what it means, but like, how is it trying to mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. So I would say that is a good starting point for us. And with that in mind, um, well, let's go. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Max and I will be your pilot this evening. So we're doing the first... <laughs> I can't think of a worse situation. <laughs> I wouldn't trust me driving a plane. Um, yeah, but I am going to be giving my reactions, thoughts, abilities. Oh, what that? Is the music too loud, Austin? Did I, did Shut I, up. Did I warn Shut you up. about that before Shut it up. started? And then you're just like, oh no, it's going to be great. I like the music. So do I, but also we shouldn't have it picking up in our microphones. Um, yes, this is, this is going to be the one where we focus on your response. Which, if we're being completely honest, the reason I'm going first is because I probably have less profound things or less things to say in general about this. But there's the fuck boy. Um... Oh, Salvador Dali. Um, 
Yeah. He I, actually makes a cameo in this movie, um, and you won't notice it. You know what? Got, yeah. what? You spotted him right away, Yeah, and I wasn't sure if that was actually him, but you're like, no, that's him. He didn't even have his mustache. Well, yeah. It's impressive. I was going to say, it's hard to recognize him if you don't know he's in it because he doesn't have his iconic stupid mustache. That's Louis Spoonwell, though. Yes. Yeah. I, I think you <laughs> told me that last time. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, this is this part, the sharpening of the razor and the woman on the balcony is what I had seen mainly in movies talking about film. I feel like that's before. a common occurrence. Yeah. But like I'd seen that and this, of course, yeah. I had seen, I like that. I like the cloud going across the moon and I like it mirroring the eyeball. I mm-hmm. think that's a, clever visual thing even if there wasn't a surrealist movie i think you could use that effectively in a movie to do that although that scene is kind of like a prologue and i want to ask you because this is where the main quote-unquote narrative thrust of the movie begins (laughs) when we watched this did you really feel like there was a, a the structure or skeleton of a narrative going on um i wasn't sure what to expect i was expecting i honestly thought there would be a slightly more strict narrative i thought like mm-hmm. it would get more and more surreal but i figured it was just like oh he killed that woman who looks a lot like her and she's gonna make the mistake of inviting him up and then like it's going to like slowly be revealed that he's an insane murderer but no we're not even getting it's just immediately like yeah it's, like, what? <laughs> it's just immediately like fuck you how dare you how dare you possibly think that there would be a straightforward narrative for this. Right. And I do like how the movie continuously mocks you for <laughs> thinking that there could be that. Right? It's fun. Cause like, it's constantly just like three, yeah, three days later or things like that, like throughout that. And it's just like, no, it's not. And it At doesn't 4-0-2 matter. At 4.02 AM. Yeah. It's like, and that's irrelevant to anything that's happening on the screen right now. Yeah. Again, this, that's the important part of it, right? This is why I feel like, you know, we can watch it now is you have that response. You see, it's like, it teases you with stuff. It's like, we can tell there's some sort of action going on, but then it just fades to like, she's putting a tie in like a suit now. (laughs) No, she's laying it out on the bed. Let me ask you, did you have a favorite performance? Um, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, they're both, they're both silent film actors, so they have to be very like overly expressive with their face and body movements. Um, I thought her uh, armpit hair was actually very good in this film. Very uh, versatile. Yeah. Um, becomes mustache hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? I she has good re- reaction shots. I no, I, I like. I I was joking. Yeah. But like, I like her. Uh, I have a personal thing with the the ants. The ants. I was uh, gonna ask you. Um. The <laughs> okay. Um. I may have done things in the past that have caused me to hallucinate and um i was on a road trip and <laughs> i had a gash in my hand I, like i had gotten like a bad paper cut or something and like this long huge cut in the middle of my hand you you've literally lived through this experience and i looked at it and it, it like turned into like some like weird eyeball thing on my hand like i looked like it looked like the pale man when like there was bugs <laughs> swarming on the ground around it and i'm just like Luckily, I was fully aware of the fact I was hallucinating, so I'm like, oh, this is cool. But it, it was something. Um, and I, am I suggesting that a lot of surrealist uh, or just like non-narrative filmmakers in general ingest drugs and then just sort of <laughs> make visual representations of what they see? Not entirely, but I'm not discounting that either. Well, I think you could, you could even with the uh, psychic automatism method right even though we just discussed how that does not actually really work with movies because it requires too much deliberate action you can sort of relate it to the idea of having a um i don't know some sort of drug experience and then trying to articulate or communicate a part of that experience yeah maybe the way like the romantic writers you know when they would take an insane amount of laudanum (laughs) well and it it, that usually infuriates me too is when an Anytime there's anything that's like surreal or non-linear or just like slightly dreamlike, people are just like, oh my God, man, they must have been so high when they came yeah, up with that idea. Annoying. I hate that. 
Because no, like you can come up with like creative, weird, bizarre, quote unquote, trippy things without being on drugs. But like there are times where I watch things and I'm just like, oh, this, this was clearly something that like yeah. you were influenced by when you were under the influence. Yeah. And there are like people who, nope. And we think this woman might be a character. And then the movie's just like, fuck you for thinking that as well. Um, well, fuck you for thinking that there might be characters in this movie. Um, we have continuity between the two yeah. main actors, right? Yes. But the, again, the continuity is never stable and never is the same form from one scene to the next. And now he's like slightly aroused because he watched somebody die. Slightly. Yeah. What did you think of this when you were watching this? Uh, I think right now this is the most interesting moment in terms of how somebody might respond to it. I, at first I was like, the French. And then (laughs) they're Spanish. I know. (laughs) <laughs> but it's a French film and it's played for a French audience. Okay, that's fair. Um, listen, I love the French. Um, <laughs> the French. But you guys are horny on Maine a lot of the time, guys. <laughs> um, and at the very least, I was just like, okay, at least she's not like giving in and she's like constantly like trying to get away and it's not just. I, I, th- I was still expecting a narrative story at this point. So was, right. like reality hadn't gone out the window for me yet. So right. I was still trying to be, think of it like, Oh, this is problematic. This isn't. And it's just like, stop it. Just, just go along. And it certainly it, is effective in making you uncomfortable. If I am trying to like find meaning in this, which I'm not supposed to do, I know. Um, but like, she like is quote unquote rescued by somebody else who comes in and then it turns out to be like the same. Yeah. Same man. Yeah. Which you, you could interpret as a lot of people like to look at him pulling this as some sort of metaphor for sexual desire. Yeah. I can't consummate my lust because of these pianos and would these that, would mules. that be, would I think the priest is just like, Oh, you have the weight of your sins <laughs> literally being pulled. There's Dolly. Look at him. Yeah. Um, if only one of those ropes. I never would have recognized him without the mustache. No, yeah, just that's the facial structure. Um, and the constipated eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if like you, if as soon as you told me he was a priest in the movie, like copy and paste the mustache onto one of those two people, it's definitely him. Sure. Do you think that uh, the hand, the ants in the hand thing was him? Um, I think that was. <laughs> Look at these ants. Yeah, but it's done in like a very good way. So yeah. like the gore in this movie is quite surprising. Like, and it, people, it's not something you might think of right away. Yeah. But at the same time, like it's done in such a good way. Like I don't know how good of a filmmaker Dolly was, but like I have a feeling it might've been his idea, but I don't think like. I think that is usually the, the uh, actual conclusion a lot of people arrive at. I know he made a number of movies. These were the biggest ones, right? I love that. Too. Yeah. That's this movie is so playful. I know that's I I I think that was the first time I laughed out loud during watching this. <laughs> I'm just like, "Oh, that's charming." I did like the pianos with the dead cows and the priests too. I thought that was visually interesting as well. Um, get out of here. But I was talking about this. And if I am trying to imply meeting, it could just be like, "Oh, well, she like has a new man and she's yeah, he's going to kick out this shitty person who like tried to rape her and is doing bad things. And then it turns out to be the same person. It's just like, Oh, well all men are shitty. And even if you get rid of one and you think he's going to be great, it's, he's going to be just as bad as the other one. But then like yet again, the movie's just sort of like, nah, why, why are you trying to ascribe meaning to this? Well, we know why, because there's continuity. Yes. I mean, some there's motifs, Right. That are repeated in this movie. Like, okay, the outfit he was wearing, the biker was wearing, he was wearing there. Right. Yes. Is this the same person? What's going on? I don't know. (laughs) But the the outfit is the same. Now sit in the naughty corner. (laughs) That made, that's always makes me laugh too. (laughs) He keeps demanding that he'd like do these things and put his head against the wall. And I think that's, that's part of why I think the, the rape scene is maybe the most particular one in terms of reaction now, because this movie has such an irreverent tone and then it just, is there a difference between doing something that's flippant in a way that is like shitty and problematic 
or in a way that is uncomfortable because it's like accusatory. I don't even know. Um, I think, I mean, cause like rape should make you uncomfortable in yes. the context of the film. And I think it takes a talented filmmaker in order to pull it off correctly. Um, if you're using it as an excuse to like get TNA in your movie, you're despicable and should not be allowed to make movies. <laughs> like this man's face <laughs> is our response to that when he's going, no. Yeah. Just the, uh, come on, man. Um, if you're using it just as like, oh, I have a female character and she needs trauma, then that's kind of lazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but if it can be used as a powerful uh, narrative tool, it's just, I don't think any subject should be inherently off limits for filmmaking, but I think you should be wary of the full weight of what you're trying to do. And that's why I'm always sort of just like, eh, when I see it in a movie, cause I'm like, I'm just waiting for them to either succeed or fail. And a lot of times they fail with it. Yeah. Because I think it's just, it's also, it's so frequently used as a device that it's like, you know, rarely is it pulled off with the same sort of gravity that you think it's justified. It's like the dog dying in some ways, which maybe is a shitty comparison, but speaks to the way in which it becomes a thing. Right. Think of the, like death wish or like a more recent example taken. Yeah. Right. It's like, well, now it's just a, an excuse for a plot with Liam Neeson it has nothing to do with the daughter. Really? That movie, you well, know, the daughter is never raped and taken to be fair. They make a okay. big, they make a big deal, but it's not that. about her trauma. Yeah. It's just an excuse for him to shoot people. Exactly. Which is, yeah. Yeah. This all, movie, all these people are just like, parse. Oh, we need to fucking close that interdimensional portal that randomly spits out dead bodies here. <laughs> exactly. I hate when that happens because they're just like, oh, it happened again. <laughs> Look at these old French fucks with a walking stick. <laughs> Coming down hard on the French today. No, I like the French. I really do. Like I have literally never met a French person that I didn't like instantly become best friends with. You like, like their champagne. Uh, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> no, I like, I, I do have a lot of, uh, out of all the exchange students that I've met, uh, the ones I've talked to the most tend to be French, but I I do. I have friends to this day who still live in France and Paris and surrounding areas. That, we can both agree, is a dolly moment. It's it's kind of too obvious to not be. Um, and I wouldn't even be surprised if that was him on the filmmaking part because it's just a zoom in. And this is fun. This is... I, I, I like this. Yeah, the weird dynamic between them and then her like hilariously like furious response to her armpit hair being stolen. Yeah. Well, which I didn't catch the first time. (laughs) I thought that was a bad like makeup smear effect and it was supposed to be like, Oh, she's trying to put on lipstick and it's like smearing up his face. No, (laughs) but no, he, for some reason stole her armpit hair and put it on his mouth now. And then she meets him again, which I, I think this a different guy. It's hard to tell sometimes. I think it might be the same guy, which would, go more to my thing of like, Oh, all men are the same regardless of if you leave one for a different one, like they're all going to treat you shitty in their own unique way at the very least. And I think this is something we agree on. There's the, the content narratively of this movie is something about a man and a woman. Yes. Which it has to be and the sex because they're, they're <laughs> the only two consistent actors right. throughout the entire movie. And they go from a place to another place. And then we think that like, oh, happiness is happening. And then no, we're just, they're dead. How dare you think that something happy or narratively like predictable would happen in this film. And well, it's interesting you say that because it does. The first title is once upon a time. Yeah. Yeah. Which is setting up your expectations for a narrative. Yeah. A certain type of romance too. a romance and a narrative structure of like a fairy tale of just like, We have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's going to be a happy ending where the the princess meets her prince and they live happily ever after. Perhaps even a a sort of parallelism to the idea of a sexual climax. Where you are not allowed to... You're not allowed to. To to, to finish with this movie. Come spring. (laughs) That'll be on the clip show for the most pretentious thing we've said. But no. This, I, I, wonder this, if they I mean, that. to be fair, this episode is basically a clip show for the most pretentious yeah, things we've ever much. Said. You know what? We're taking the bullet for you guys. So shut, yeah. them, shut up. We I know s- everybody needs people to talk about this movie. What, what do, you, do you think of the ending, though? Um, 
I it kind of sums up what I feel about this entire short, honestly, in one frame where it's visually interesting um, and intentionally narratively disappointing, which I think suits it perfectly. And as somebody who <laughs> tries to make films and is involved in that, like it's frustrating because I am trying to constantly put narrative in things and put it in place and try to make sense of it. And this movie actively fights against that. And I, where there are, as I mentioned before, there are movies with surreal narratives that I get frustrated with because I can tell that it was used as a band-aid for a lack of creativity rather than right. an excess of creativity, not wanting to be weighed down by a traditional narrative. There are some films where it's just like, oh no, you just didn't have a story to tell. You just wanted to show some random bullshit and call it, yeah, art. And if you don't get it, then, oh, you're not smart enough to get it. No, it's just, you're not creative enough and you're not nearly as smart as you think you are. This movie, I think it sets out to do something in particular. It accomplishes that very well. Um, even if it is kind of like, oh, you made this specifically to be accepted into a surrealist community. Right. It does check off the boxes of like what you want in a, in a surrealist short film and fighting against a traditional narrative. And I think effectively punishing me for trying to find not necessarily meaning, but structure cohesion and a narrative in there uh, is what I respect most about this film. Yeah. I think the music is so appropriate because that is 100% the movie's tone and yeah. attitude towards you trying to like, <laughs> just figure it out. It's like, it's so goofy. I'm talking about the tango music, by yeah. the way. Yeah. It's like, fuck you. <laughs> like it, it's uh, I think again, having the comparison to like, imagine, you know what? It's almost like a film class, like a, mo a movie they made for a film class kind of. Yeah. Right. Except imagine if somebody made a film class that was like all about just being provocative for the enjoyment and like shocking of your class. Like what if somebody made, I'm trying to think of an equivalent for an actual film class nowadays, but it's hard, but you understand what I'm saying is like, imagine if somebody came in with something that was just totally irreverent and honestly kind of light as a feather, but it was really well made. It's a really well made feather, even though it has means nothing. It amounts to nothing other than the experience of watching it though, which is where, yeah. where it's sort of success lies. But yeah, you, do you think you're going to watch this movie again? Oh yeah. In the well, future? like this is, that's the thing with short films. Like I don't need to commit <laughs> a, a, <laughs> exactly. a time. I can, if I felt like it, I could pull this up on YouTube and watch it in its 15 minute runtime. And then like, yeah, still go out to a bar that night. I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to devote an evening in order to watch this. So I'm much more likely to watch short films. <laughs> do again. you think it has, uh, We'll talk maybe again about this after the show, but do you think you feel more compelled after watching this to check out more Boonwell movies? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Because I think, I don't even know if this is the best movie, to be honest. Well, you were mentioning the, the follow-up collaboration, and I'm slightly interested in that, but I'll get back to you in future episodes on sure. how I feel about we that. Will. So I think we're going to be ready to fire it up again now. Yeah, so I'll blend the plane, and then you can take over from here, Austin. Aye, aye, Captain. That's really, I cannot believe, whatever, whatever. I didn't know what people expected. This oh, God, time. we're hitting turbulence. Oh, 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 oh fuck. <laughs> and welcome back, everybody. We're going to be doing this again. Yes. Double uh, trouble. Austin's in the pilot seat now oh jesus he he's this again all right he's steering well anyway i'm glad you brought that joke back up it's not really a joke it's just yeah. it's what's happening we're flying a plane while watching this surrealist short film so one thing i haven't mentioned about this movie yet we've talked about the experience of watching it sort of taking precedent to the actual text itself and in that sense you can kind of examine this movie in the tradition of what people might refer to as the cinema of attractions okay. and i think that's one of your favorite terms to bring up yes because it deals very much with a certain type of cinema that i think is uh very fun 
and also very aware of its audience in a clever way. And it sort of encourages a different type of engagement with the movie than simply watching it uh, and looking purely at the film itself, but also like my experience watching it in the physical space I'm occupying and how it's framed. We're watching this on a TV. We're not watching it on a computer. Does that change the mechan- mechanism of how we're engaging with it? But anyway, I think, uh, oh God, whenever he cuts his thumb, tests it on his thumbnail, that just bothers the shit out well, of me. Well, that's one of those examples, and you see that in horror now, where it's yeah. just like, oh, why is it that like, it makes you cringe. Yeah. It's because like, it's, it's you like you can relate to that. Yes. You've, relatable violence. You felt a, not necessarily equivalent pain, but pain that yes. is similar to that in your brain. Yeah. It's like the, yes, that's a very good point to make. And I think this movie, again, I think one of the things I respond to it now and why it's not necessarily trapped in amber for me is this idea of how it films provocative imagery it's purely in the framing and the juxtaposition through editing. Right. And how that works. I think a lot of the the editing of this movie is very key to how it works because we see a lot of stuff where it has, if we look at it in reference to classical Hollywood editing, it sort of encourages you to read it in reference to that type of editing style. But the discontinuity, whether it's spatially or in terms of time or in terms of objects and characters, uh, prevents the sort of continuity of classical classical Hollywood editing from really taking full effect and it's the contrast of those two things right but there all right we we already we were talking about some things that quote this movie and this movie quotes things as well as we can see with the Vermeer painting but um one of the interesting things is uh looking at how many things sort of interact with this movie right um a lot of people point to the use of the box as a motif and then looking at David Lynch is this happening inside the box? We faded from outside the box, sort of like we're going through a keyhole and now we're on the inside, but there it is. So I don't know. Right. And then we have all these scenes that seem to build and have a sort of progression from one moment to the next, but then the climax and culmination of those scenes doesn't make any sense. And then we're <laughs> on to the next thing. And there's also just subtle things like when she's coming out of the door, right? She comes out of the door twice. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's, it's done so quick. You're yeah, just like you. You're like what? Uh huh. But you, your brain can recognize things that are repeated, so you're not let off the hook. You know, it's very important that it's not entirely random. You know, we see the outfit again, but it's like, why is she folding it? We see the box again. Why is it there? Also, I didn't bring this up, but what the fuck is with that outfit? <laughs> like, well, a lot of people, again, that's a lot of people like to speculate whether that's a nun outfit or something, or there's some sort of subtext about a masculine identity and a feminine identity that both make up the psyche of this man. By the way, we mentioned her reaction shots already. She has some really great, like grumpy or exasperated faces. I really love that. Or people looking at this imagery with the hand, right? The hole in the hand and looking at it as a type of, uh, idea of stigmata, right? And the bugs are Lynchian too. And you're talking about this dark underbelly of like Christian ideology, in repressive ideology. Okay. That's coming through (laughs) this awkward eye contact they're making. Again, I don't necessarily (laughs) do love that shot. I'm just like, are you fucking seeing this? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And then it goes to the armpit hair, which is going to be repeated later to an urchin, which is not repeated at all. And again, this is the other way in which there's continuity between geometry, right? And again, the urchin becomes a circle, but it becomes a circle. That's not black. It's an image now. And then it fades to this. Which again, and then this is playing with some Freudian imagery, the idea of castration pretty much um, as as represented by this severed hand and then this this woman who people love to talk about this person, right? And how they are presented in a slightly androgynous manner. Yeah. And people pulling apart the threads of like how gender works in this movie, right? And uh, again, the movie never allows you to arrive at a conclusion. And again, now that hand is in the box and now she has the box. What does it mean? And she seems to have like some level of authority because like the cop salutes her and then hands her the evidence and then. And she has sort of his attention. Yeah. Right. Because as we see after, uh, after these people disperse and every time she comes close to getting hit by a car, he seems to get more and more agitated or excited depending on how you're looking at it. Yeah. 
And in that sense, I think uh, you compared this movie to uh, sort of the Soviet films of the time. And I think that's a very appropriate comparison. I think this movie is very much, because of the editing, again, yeah. relies on uh, I only, you know, the creative things you can do when you embrace the Soviet idea of how montage works. I had brought that up in our pre, uh, yeah. pre-screening for this. I didn't really bring yeah. it up. And yeah. just the idea of like the Kuleshov effect in general. Yeah. In filmmaking. This movie is really recruiting that idea in the name of surrealism and in the name of getting under the skin of uptight, rich people. Which is always, that should be your objective in any terms of art form, is will it upset rich white people? If not, you're not doing your job correctly. Yeah. So, yeah, I honestly, I am, jury's out on this moment. I'm not entirely sure what to make of it. And I don't mean the movie itself, but just how I feel about this sort of sexual violence, this like rape scene, right? Where it's like, it definitely characterizes him as monstrous and like horrifying in this way. And I know that the movie is inc- is like playing with associations between this and like conventional ideas of marriage and uh, sort of, I don't know, playing with the idea or the pretense of having th- of morality. Right. But I don't know. It just makes me so uncomfortable more so than anything else. More than the slitting eyeball and the bugs in the hand. And of course, because bed. again, I think an interesting thing about that, and maybe we can compare it to just watching other movies in general. We were talking about when we were doing your run of this, how sexual violence in other movies tend to make us feel. And maybe that is a weird surrealist viewing moment too, just in other movies, right? Because then the tenet of surrealism that we find in this movie comes to the forefront of other ones where it's like, how I feel about this is now becoming something that's preoccupying more of my mind than the fact of the thing itself. I would agree with you that on that more if this hadn't come out in an era where like sexual violence in movies was nearly unheard of at the time this like this came out in the what the 20s like i guess but also i'm thinking of this in context of other movies that would be released in this specific milieu i guess time, yeah which you know it's not like it's not like the prime topic necessarily but you know uh i, I wouldn't say it's devoid of it another uh sort of early surrealist classic that came out a few years before this movie the smiling madame bidet yeah it's very much a, a movie about if not physical violence um, between, you know, a husband and a wife is certainly like torture and like uh, mental abuse. But anyway, I think a lot of this movie sort of plays with those ideas, but because it's so irreverent, you know, it's hard to attach a certain uh, idea of what is respectful or in good taste. You know what I mean? But again, this movie is spitting in the eye of good taste is the weird thing. So I don't know. But anyway, also another thing I wanted to mention that I think is uh, definitely the case in terms of those shots of the hands and some other objects in this movie is how this movie sort of displaces our notion of what makes for a close-up, where usually a close-up is like referring to a reaction shot or something, right? And illustrating something about a character. But in this, we get these weird reaction shots where it's like we don't fixate on the reaction, we fixate on the image, you know, and it's sort of like drawing us in. It's like it looks salaciously at the hand with the ants coming out of it, if that makes sense. Like we really, really get to leer at these weird objects. And that's like the sort of uh, I wanted to gravity point that around which everything else sort of falls around. I wanted to bring up, is it relevant? Because we were talking about like the, the feminine, masculine in the outfit there. Is it relevant that he is back in the outfit at the point where he's getting emasculated by this other man. And- sure. A lot of people um, have associations between that, right? And uh, then the fact that this man is going to turn around and we see that it's him. You know what I mean? So there's a doubling situation in this. Obviously, they're just using another actor. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the hair this- isn't even close to similar. Right. But that shouldn't be something you you're concerned about in this mm-hmm. type of movie. I'm not going to be like, oh, well, actually, if you see here, the chair's here in this scene, and then it's in a different place than the other time. Take that movie. But yeah, uh, I think, I don't know. I, It's such a, 
it's such a good movie to I I think not merely watch in terms of uh watching the entire thing because like you said it's short but it's very quotable because there's so much like <laughs> disjunction between things quotable well yeah i mean there's a lot of single no, it's moments just, it's just funny to me because like quotable in a silent film is a funny way to put it <laughs> sure but i mean there are things in this movie that i feel like are called back to frequently yeah oh no definitely but it lends itself to that because it is very much i'm not going to say collage like but it's all over the place, and because it is built to not have perfect continuity, you can quote one specific image, and it sticks out to somebody's memory because this movie's a collection of images, you know? And then people like to some, sort of read into the idea that the sort of, like, intellectual art object or whatever turns into a weapon, and then he's going to kill this other version of himself. Right. Of course, this intense psychodrama between the doubles, right, amounts to literally fucking nothing. Right. Also, I think one thing about this movie is just the sheer execution of it is very beautiful. Oh, no. The way they pulled off that that sort of weird jump cut with the with the environment where he falls and then he continues falling into a completely different setting. And especially for two 20 somethings in the 20s, like who were like basically just trying to break into an art scene movement. Like that kind of makes it all, all the more impressive considering yeah. what they were working with at the time. Yeah. They did not have a lot of money. It was financed by, by Boonwell's mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, uh, I, I seriously doubt this made a ton of money. <laughs> and certainly uh, after the riots, after uh, their next collaboration, I don't know how much money he was making in France at that time. Um, but I hope she was proud of him because certainly this is an achievement. Listen, if if I ever have a kid by some glorious mistake and they make a piece of art that incites a riot, I'll be proud of them because they managed to make something that spoke to enough people, even if it made them angry, like it got them motivated enough to start a fucking riot. Well, again, we're talking now, we're getting to a sort of political idea of what surrealism looks to achieve. Yeah. And again, the political nature of this right and how that that in how it mixes with the playfulness i think is very much why i feel like this is a Boonwell movie rather than a a dali movie right because fascism is the is the sort of it can't deal with playfulness you know what i mean there's no place for playfulness in the like fascist ideology well no because it's about projected strength and yeah if the second you try to like be irreverent. Be irreverent or make fun of your projected strength, it disappears, and then your entire system comes tumbling down. Yeah, it's sort of like with to be or not to be. How do you make the most subversive, fascist, anti-fascist propaganda movie? You make a comedy about it. Yeah. You know? And then you point out how fucking stupid they are. <laughs> and that's why it's subversive. And that, I think, is why this, again, a big part of why it feels fresh and interesting now is not merely because of how creative they were in terms of coming up with the imagery, which, you know, they came up with the imagery through uh, just sheer association and like psychic automatism. Right. I think they did a good job with that, even if they couldn't literally make the movie that way. But I think the playfulness is what animates this movie. You know, it brings it to life and uh, you know, everything is perfectly set up to avoid you from arriving at some sort of, final conclusion about it well and that like coming to conclusions like you like this movie are, is gonna make you think regardless and unfortunately i'm not just saying this as like a leftist person but like one of the key tenets of fascism is like the will of your nation try yeah will triumph over like the lesser nations who have to think for themselves and come right. to conclusions that way so like your ideology doesn't really allow you <laughs> to appreciate art that's bent on the thing of thinking when thinking is something that goes against your political ideology. Right. And I think, again, part of you're speaking more to why I think this is subversive, because if you have an ideology that is um, sort of bent like that, they still technically have a weird type of entrance point. The entrance point being the most generic of all story openings once upon a time. Yeah. Right. Um, this movie is built to engage with all sorts of people. And I think that also makes it really interesting. It's both very much of its time and specifically of its place and for a specific audience, but in a way that allows it to be read 
across different generations in different countries and, and ha- still retain a certain type of provocative power. And uh, that's a rare achievement to be able to pull that off. I, you know, there aren't really a lot of movies that, you know, nail the sort of affective quality of surrealism in such a definitive way as this, you know, even though this is a movie that you, there's no last word on it because it's built to not to refute that, you know? Yeah, no. And that's why I felt that after I watched it and you presented the idea for how we're going to do the format of it, I came around to it because in the end, like, I think the more people talk about movies like this and the more people put in their two cents, like the more richer of a understanding of the movie and even like the genre of surrealism as a whole will have. And I mean, we can even sort of trace a line between that and just stuff like Godard where he took that, that line of thinking and he made it so political that that's like the content of the movie. But also it's like, it's this idea that it's not even talking about the movie so itself as it's like it's gifting you a way of thinking about movies that is interesting in its own right. And it, it, it makes me want to watch movies that are normal in a different way. Sort of like um, with, uh, oh God, Andre. It's not Gita. My dinner with Andre? No, not him either. <laughs> Founder of Surrealism. Fuck! Whatever. I was about to say Andre Serrano, but that's much later on. Whatever. Point is, you know, these guys would, when they were watching movies, they didn't want to sit there and watch a narrative play out in front of them. They'd go to a theater and they would hop between one movie and the next. And then they would create this experience in their own minds of associating these random bits that they caught from everything. And that would be their day watching movies. You know what I mean? It's a viewing practice that is not at all intended, but it's, it's all grist for the mill. Of, of your own like psychology that you're cultivating. Right. And I think that's an interesting way to engage with stuff. And I think that's part of the value in this movie and the value of learning about it. If you just watch it and you're yeah, just that's like, what well, I'm that, saying. that was weird. Well, well all films kind of do that to a degree. All films will be impacted by whatever baggage you're carrying with sure. you. And that will affect how you view it, how you interact with it and how much you like it. I think the good part about, surrealist narratives and even just abstract film in general is that it kind of brings that part to the forefront and yeah. makes you analyze not just the film itself, but also what you're bringing to it. And that makes you more conscious of a film goer in general, regardless yeah. of whether or not the movie is actively trying to engage that part of you. Yeah. So, you know, I think obviously when that doesn't work, it somehow backfires and becomes way more aggravating. Yes. But I think in the good examples, it creates a really unique and very memorable experience in terms of watching movies that it's like, I really don't associate my experience of watching this movie with a sort of genuine experience I've had watching a lot of other stuff, you know, and this movie is something that changes the way I watch other things, you know? So it's, it's a very unique, I mean, very unique is not correct. Point is it's a special place in which this this movie occupies and that's why it's worth not just watching for the sake of watching it but really exploring why it's valuable you know yeah so yeah no it's a different experience and i'm i'm glad we did it um, it's weird to think about ending this episode well no i i'm <laughs> i was just gonna say well i'm glad that we did something like this art yeah artsy and impactful uh, join us nep- next episode for my pick which is going to be a uh, shrek 2 <laughs> we're going to be talking about that the entire time um specifically re-edited version of shrek 2 that's not available online enjoy <laughs> no <laughs> no that's not what we're doing but but yeah but it's weird because we just spent an entire movie or entire commentary talking about like how the conversation on this can't end <laughs> because that it's built to not end. So yeah, so we're just going to stop. Yeah, um, this has been the Spectator Film Podcast. You can find us on <laughs> iTunes, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, and our website, spectatorfilmpodcast.com. Um, if this is your first episode joining us, we normally do full-length movies. This has been a bit of a weird episode. Also, if this is the first episode you're joining us, uh, it's an interesting place to start off. Go and listen to one of our other episodes, too. Um, I'm Max. He's Austin. We'll see you next time.